Welcome to the U3 Media Podcast, where our mission is to unite the world through coffee, connecting you to the farmers and coffee entrepreneurs through the stories they share. I'm Christy Ross, and joining us today is Mark Inman with Mercon Specialty as their Director of Specialty Coffee. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, Mark, from everything I've read about you, you've been involved in a numerous aspects of coffee, including mm-hmm. sustainable agriculture. You've mm-hmm. been the voice for the small farmer yep. and have really focused on improving environmental and social conditions in the coffee industry. And we're going to dive into all of those details to some degree. But first, how did you get your start in coffee and why coffee? Well, I think most people that have been in coffee professionally got into it accidentally, and I, I'm no different than that. Uh, I was a uh, a student, a wine student, going to uh, to college to be an enologist, a, a winemaker. And uh, as many broke students uh, have the issue that they don't have a lot of money, and I took a gig uh, judging a coffee competition. Uh, and from that, I thought, well, I have a wine palette. I'll come in and do really well and, you know, impress everyone. And I learned coffee cupping and, and learned how complex and challenging it was. And uh, from there, I, I had conversations with the person who won the competition and learned the similarities of coffee and wine and became fascinated by that. And I was literally asked by that company to quit the wine industry and come join coffee. This is in the late 80s. And I, I took it wholeheartedly and uh, have been on that journey ever since. So is is coffee um, more complex than wine? Or would you say wine is, is more complex? Uh, I think there's a lot of similarities. There's more similarities than differences. I would say coffee is probably more complex because you're not... Um, wine is, is about uh, creation, creating by adding a lot of inputs. Coffee, at least at this stage, doesn't really do a lot of that. You, you're seeing it more with yeast and enzymes and things like that. But uh, so it's, it's relied solely on its terroir, the varietal and the treatment of processing and uh, which makes it a much more complex beverage. Let's talk about how your career evolved and talk about maybe some of the choices that you made along the way into the different roles that you've taken. Sure. So, you know, I started initially just learning. I, I uh, w- uh, lived in northern Colombia, learned about uh, coffee growing methodology and processing and the, the whole uh, gamut. My background, you know, was mostly agricultural based. That was where my interests lied. Um, and one of the things that struck me early on was um, was the livelihoods of coffee growers compared to that of grape growers. And it was much more... Um, surrounded by poverty and um, and political turmoil, much more so than you see in wine. You don't have a, a fair trade trade equivalent for wine production. It's not necessary. Um, and I remember I was in Nicaragua, I believe it was, uh, God, early 90s, 91. And I went to a house uh, where somebody had grown at, at the time some of the best coffee in Nicaragua. And they, there was a girl there, and I use this, the picture of this, this woman a lot in my presentations. And she was, I say, you know, how old does this woman look to you? And people will say eight or nine. And she was 16. And she was 16 because she was so malnourished from lack of food security. And they were growing very high quality coffee. And I thought that, that there was a problem with that. The idea that high quality specialty growers still suffered from abject poverty was unacceptable to me. So it really changed my focus in coffee. And I got very interested in, in trying to up the game in coffee. And that became a focus that's lasted till this day. Um, actually was a part, my, my company that I started back then, uh, we had a, a 200 acre organic educational farm in Northern California where we taught permaculture, which is now, you know, fast forward to uh, regenerative agriculture. And um, and we took that education around the world, teaching farmers to grow not only specialty coffee, but uh, sustainable specialty coffee, which became certified with the goal of getting them higher levels of income to alleviate the poverty that they were surrounded by. Yeah. Wow. So impactful. Just by, just by that one experience, like what 
and how that shaped your future and your trajectory. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So for someone entering the coffee industry for the first time, what would you yeah. encourage them to experience, like to gain experience in so that they have the right foundation? Um, and just what should they focus on first, would you say? I would say first and foremost, it's about education and taking advantage of every educational opportunity there is in coffee. That can be networking with roasters or, or coffee shops. It can be taking volunteer opportunities within associations like the Specialty Coffee Association or the Roasters Guild or competitions. Um, it's reading as much as you can, being involved in forums and just starting to integrate yourself in that community of coffee where most of the, 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 the higher level learning happens. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so today you're with Mercon, which is a green coffee supplier that has what a global reach of like more than 60 countries or so. Um, yes. They do so much more than just sell green coffee, right? Yeah. I mean, Mercon in, in many ways reflects a lot of the interests I had in coffee, which was educating producers. So they have a program called Lift that's an uh, educational uh, platform that assists growers to become better at the tr uh, trade of, of coffee agriculture. Uh, learning about the trade of coffee in the United States, Europe, and Japan, um, and and basically how to be a coffee entrepreneur. It's it's a program that has, has had a lot of success, uh, which has helped them set themselves apart from other import companies. Yeah, no, I love that. So they're B two B, so they sell green coffee, but do they do any B two C? Do they do they sell any green coffee to to the end customer ever? Not at this time, no. So a lot of uh, multinational importers do have, uh, you know, roasting uh, operations in countries, but at this stage, Mercon does not. Yeah. So when I think about um, you doing green coffee sales or leading, you know, green coffee sales, I feel like you need to have traveled, you know, to origin at least a couple of times to truly understand and sell the story and make the connections, right? Um, but you've actually run a farm, like you talked about before, or owned a farm in California. Uh, when was the first time you traveled to a coffee origin? Uh, it was early on. I mean, I went to Northern Columbia in 1989, I believe. Uh, that was my second year in coffee. And I was up in Northern Columbia with Kogi Indians and uh, a very unusual as uh, type of coffee farming up there and an unusual group of people in the scheme of things as far as producers go. Uh, and then from there, I started traveling to Nicaragua pretty early on and doing a lot of, I, that was a real big hub for me for many years. Uh, but yeah, that the, my travels have taken me to just about every coffee producing nation in the world. You are a world traveler, that's for sure. And you're heading off to Brazil here soon. So um, so how do you, how many different countries are there that are doing coffee? Like how many have you been to? Oh, I mean, I, I, I can't even, uh, I mean, well over 30 I've been to, um, yeah, I mean, about 30. I aspire to be like you. I've been to one <laughs> at this point. Well, you know, people say that. I, I get that a lot. And I did a, an interview a long time ago with a, a site called The Art of Manliness that studied, like, I want your job was the thing. And it was like jet pilots and astronauts. And somehow I got roped into that. And that was the thing is, oh, you must, you know, love traveling to all these places in the world. And it, it, I'm not in like the beach. I'm not in, uh, you know, necessarily easy areas. A lot of coffee purchasing and traveling is in remote, rough areas. So you get very used to having a lot of tropical illnesses. You get very used to rough travel. You get very used to sleeping on dirt floors. And um, so it, it, it's not a, a definitely a job for everybody. Um, as romantic as it sounds. Right, right. No, that totally makes sense. Thanks for sharing that because I think that's so true. So, okay. So um, when you, one more thing about sort of visiting origin, was there a, something that like a particular aha moment of how you saw things could improve? Now you talked a little bit about um, the, the woman you met who was actually mm -hmm. 16. Um, right. Was that your big aha moment or were there others along the way that sort of helped you figure out like how things could improve? I mean, that was probably the biggest one. I would say the other aha moments are involved around compare. I mean, I, I compare and contrast coffee to wine a lot. And so 
uh, coffee production, you know, to me equaled wine production of the 1920s. You, you had, you know, you were basically fermenting coffee in, in wooden boxes or tile tubs. You're not using stainless steel. You're not using, you know, polyethylene uh, containers. Uh, you're not using temperature and pH control. And so you, you see a lot of the possibilities of what can be done uh, to improve coffee, as much as we, you know, everybody gets excited about, oh, I, you know, I saw this geisha went for two hundred dollars a pound. There is so much more upside potential to coffee. We haven't even begun to crack the opportunities on how great can coffee be. It's, it's, we have a long ways to go. Just in the past five years, you're seeing, you know, yeast and enzymes being used in processing, and you have all of this you know, fascination with that world. And that's just, just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do. Yeah, that's exciting to hear because as I enter the world of coffee, you know, I feel like it's saturated and maybe it's already perfected and, you know, what am I jumping into? And yet I'm discovering every day there are areas for improvement and it just, um, but it but it takes people, you know, coming together, pulling together and, and sort of moving the Titanic because that's what it feels like. I mean, this is not just a local industry. I mean, this is a this is a right. global industry for sure. It's a global industry and we learn from each other. I mean, there, think about, you know, Blue Bottle uh, as a brand, you know, was fascinated with the, the Japanese coffee culture and a lot of what they adopted at Blue Bottle were uh, preparation methods and, and uh, drink styles that were being done in Tokyo. So uh, we are always borrowing from each other, which is great and helps, you know, rise the tide. I mean, the whole fascination with cold coffee uh, also comes from Asia and, uh, and, and vice versa, you know, their, their obsession with like craft roasting and everything came from the United States. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, all right, I'm going to shift from sort of farming to roasting and, and um, I'll share with you, I bought a Loring roaster, uh, just got delivered this year, but I heard that you helped create the first Loring roaster. And I would love for you to share that story here. Well, I didn't help create it. I was uh, our company was an investor in the brand early on. We were the beta testers, so um, that part uh, I can say we did from day one. I tested the prototypes by myself with my staff. Uh, we you know worked all the way up to the model that you have today. You know, I, I troubleshoot uh, everything, and we did a lot of experimentation back then. That. Uh, Knowing what I know now and the age I am now, I probably wouldn't have agreed to do uh, because I, you know, in one case, I caused an explosion that blew apart a wall in the building. I could have killed somebody. I mean, there was oh just crazy things that we were doing to see what was possible with this roaster. Um, looking back, they're all, you know, fun stories, but it was very risky at the time. The idea that we were able to enter the market, though, with a machine that was, you know, hand built in California. Um, using technology that was very, you know, relatively new in, in coffee roasting and that the large roasting companies allowed us to grow that brand to the size that it is today without really any competition was always very amazing to me. Um, it's a it's a fantastic machine and it's it's run by a fantastic group of people. Um, but I don't know today if you'd be able to create something without the competition quickly jumping in and, and bringing a machine, you know, machine that's like yours up against you quickly. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally makes sense. So um, one of the things that you it's just by all the stories you're sharing already, it, it, what is what is clear about you is you just dive in. You just figure it out and um, you make things happen, right? But, but yeah. it is about participating. It's about being right. part of the process. So on top of all your different roles throughout your career, you know, you, you served in a number of volunteer roles as well, like for the roasting community, um, barista community, you know, the Specialty Coffee Association of America, World Coffee Events Chairperson, Roasters Guild Chairperson, Board of the... Uh, board member of International Women's Coffee Alliance. I could go on and on, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, um, but out of participating in all of those, is there a particular contribution you made or impact you've had that, that maybe you're mm -hmm. most proud of? Yeah, there are two in particular. I mean, I, 
you rattle all these off and I just jokingly, I say I'm going for the EGOT award, which is like, you know, the Emmy Tony, uh, that I'm trying to be, uh, you might get uh, that, Mark. You might get that. <laughs> I'm, well, I have breezed a good left and that's it. I've done them all. Uh, so, but the two, the two biggest accomplishments I, I had in these volunteer capacities, well, for one, just to participate in volunteering, mentoring, you know, that's, that. those are the big reasons why I do what I do. Um, but the two big things were when I was president of the SCA, you have to put on the conference and you get to create a theme. And my theme was about agroecology and an agriculture based show, which had not been done before. This was uh, Minneapolis in 2008. Uh, at that time, they said, oh, well, it's in Minneapolis. It's not going to be a big attended show. You know, don't get your hopes up for this one compared to like New Orleans or, or you know, Portland or Seattle. And I decided to flip the script and, and really try to increase the amount of producer participation by bringing in uh, the best agronomists in the world to teach what can be possible in coffee. And a lot of what we've been talking about today, I wanted to prove it in real time. And that show at the time was one of the most uh, financially successful shows that SCA ever had. Um, the second thing that I you know, really am proud of is that as the chair of the World Barista Championship, I brought the first World Barista Championship to a producing country, which was Bogota in 2011. Up until then, it was always Europe, Japan, or the United States, and that's it. They were consuming countries. Uh, and there is a vibrant coffee culture in Latin America, and I wanted that to be reflected in this competition. I love that. So, so if you were to describe the coffee community, would you would you use the word like siloed or rather like a strong sense of, of camaraderie? Definitely a strong sense of camaraderie. I mean, you look at the and there it's by it's all segmented, like the barista culture hangs out amongst themselves, the roasters hang around amongst themselves, uh, traders. It, there's not a lot of cross pollinization. Uh, but the individual communities that exist are extremely uh, interactive. They're extremely welcoming. They're extremely sharing and open with their time and energy and information. Uh, you know, how I got onto this today was through a friend from the, the Roasters Guild that I, you know, he said, this is something that you should do. And I did it. I didn't even ask questions about it. So uh, that kind of that's the community that we all live in. And it's a fantastic community. It's unlike you know, a lot of industries that I, I tend to rub elbows with, you don't see a similar uh, type um, openness and willingness to help each other out. Yeah, I, I have to say, again, jumping in for the first time into this industry, everybody has been so incredibly helpful and so willing to make introductions and just have a conversation. And um, it is super refreshing because I come from financial services, which is very siloed. Um you know, they're, they're not helping each other out in this no. way. So this is really refreshing. It's been so fun for me. I, I totally love it. So, um, so, okay. So I'm going to uh, talk one more thing about your career, like sort of looking sure. back, mm -hmm. you focused on, you know, sustainability issues in the specialty mm -hmm. coffee industry, dating back to over 20 years ago. Um, and I saw that you were a columnist actually writing about it back then. Right. So for people that are not familiar, can you give, let's say, a 30,000 foot view of what some of those issues were 20 years ago versus what some of them are today? Well, I would say 20 years ago, these issues were much more important. At least they're, they're much more relevant uh back then than they are now. I mean, they're, they're extremely relevant now, but we were talking about this very early on. And so the main things are like uh, back then was it was the birth of fair trade and the idea of a floor price for coffee. Uh, that was born of those years, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, big push into shade agriculture. And, you know, coffee is a multi-level story crop and it needs shade to survive. Um, the, the heirloom varieties like Bourbon and Tipica need multiple levels of shade, but that today is the you know equivalent of regenerative agriculture and the idea of carbon capture. I mean, these were farms that were carbon positive. They were pulling carbon from the atmosphere, not emitting carbon. Uh, you know, we were anti, um, 
monoculture and full sun agriculture, and that uh, still exists today. But uh, back then, it seems like these were new concepts in the industry, and, and I was pushing and pushing to get people to to make this about what their business would be focused on to support these types of efforts. Uh, now, this whole push into regenerative agriculture, and, and now you have regulation coming into Europe about the types of coffee you can import. You can't have deforestation uh, involved at all in coffee. You can't have child labor issues. These are now regulated by the EU. This was stuff that we talked about 20 years ago is wouldn't it be great if we can get to this place? And here we are. Yeah. And so looking forward, you know, what is what is something that you're like, you know, 20 years from now, you hope we accomplish what? Like how how can we address whatever that topic is? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll give you one right away. I, 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 this is something I'm a huge proponent of re- certified organic regenerative agriculture. And ROC is the certification seal uh, that does coffee. They do fiber. They do cocoa and bananas. But uh, I equate it to the idea of, you know, climate change is incredibly important for everybody or most people. I mean, some people don't believe in it, but for those that do. Um, you know, climate change is is vital. Now, people are willingly spending $100,000 on an electric vehicle, thinking that they're doing their part to mitigate climate change. And I have always argued you're wasting your time by owning an electric car. You might as well drive a tank to work. It makes no difference whatsoever. And this is where I come to that conclusion. Uh, One container ship on the water equals 50 million vehicles as far as the polluting power each year. 13 or no 16 sorry 16 container ships on the water equals the polluting power of every car on the planet and there are 5600 container ships on the water right now so owning an electric vehicle is meaningless yet ocean freight represents only uh three percent of global carbon emissions Agriculture, on the other hand, represents 30% of global carbon emissions. So if we were to embrace regenerative agriculture, we would we could halt climate change, just food, food production. Uh, we could reverse climate change if all food on the planet was grown regeneratively. That, is, that involves nothing to do with anything other than agricultural uh, practices. Uh, everything else that we do would be adding to that. So the fact that we as an industry can participate in halting climate change is pretty powerful. And it's something that we can do. And ideally, 20 years from now, uh, that's something that we've accomplished is to to halt climate change or, or halt carbon emissions. Those numbers are staggering, Mark. They really are staggering. What, what can the everyday consumer do to help then? If, if, if get, you know, buying an electric vehicle is not helping, what can the everyday consumer do? Well, it, it, although it's quite new, if you see the regenerative organic seal on a package, it, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a Patagonia shirt, because Patagonia is a big backer of that movement, Dr. Bronner's or, you know, any kind of coffee that's carrying this seal, buy it because you're actually doing good work. Uh, if you can't find a regenerative um, seal on any package, support organic agriculture. That it, Organic agriculture by its nature needs biodiversity to flourish. And biodiversity is carbon capture, is climate change reversal. So that's the, that's the easy and quick way t- uh, to do it. Yeah. Can I, can I ask a sort of a, um, I'm going to, I guess I'll call it a hot topic around organic because again, I'm still learning. And so organic is, is, it's also expensive to get that certification, right? For, for farmers. So what if there are farmers that are doing essentially everything organic, but just can't pay for the organic certification or recertification or, or something like that? Like how do you, I mean, the thing is, is you would have no way of knowing that. So yes, there are plenty of farmers that are doing that type of work that for whatever reason, usually you can afford the certification because it's backed with a contract. And, you know, a lot of the old adages of, well, if you go organic, there's this three-year lag period uh, where they lose yield. Well, that's based on really antiquated uh, agricultural education. With modern education, uh, you don't have these drops in yields. You're able to continue. In fact, you can increase yields in organic ag. But for whatever reason, if you're part of a small farmer, you're not a part of a cooperative and you can't afford to do it, 
by all means, if you're able to sell coffee and somebody understands that, yes, support that. But how do you deliver that message from, say, a small village in West Java to, to you? It's virtually impossible. They would have to do that locally. And, you know, luckily, a lot of producing nations are also consuming nations. So that's, yeah. you know, one way to accomplish that. Yeah, true. Education plays such a key role, right? Um, okay, so... I, I did read that you were on the floor of the United Nations. What were you doing there? Like, what was the, how did that transpire? Was that during the, the um, World Barista Championship or what was that? No, no I was uh, a representative of the SCAA uh, for the in- uh, International Institute for Sustainable Development. And it was talking about, uh, you know, areas of I was representing specialty coffee where specialty coffee can play a role in uh, in halting child labor, uh, increasing biodiversity, uh, water rights, water security, food security. These were a series of meetings that were taking place in Geneva at the UN. So I was I was the SA rep uh, during that time. Got it. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to shift to mentorship because you, you mentioned it before and I am a strong believer in mentorship. It's super important, but you, like you've been mentoring your children, even in the startup coffee business. I would love to do that. First of all. Okay. My, yeah. I, I think my kids didn't want to go into to finance or pharma. My husband was right. in pharma. So, you know, I'm like maybe coffee, maybe coffee, but you have that and you're, mm-hmm. you're helping them, guiding them. What kind of guidance and unsolicited advice do you give to them? Um, and in turn, what advice do they actually seek from you? Because as a mother of three, I know that, you know, trying to give advice versus when they come to you for advice, it, it can be very different because we all want to mentor, right? We will all want to share right. the things that we've learned. Right. Well, okay. So if we're specifically talking about my, my children, my son, uh, when he was seven, uh, well, when I was a child, my, my dad really pushed me to create a business. No matter what it was, you would learn something valuable, uh, learning how to read a you know, P&L statement, how to... Um, deal with bill collecting, how to market, you know, it was so I created a surfboard and surfwear company when I was very young. Um, My son, uh, because his mother was in coffee and I was in coffee, he decided to go that route. So he started roasting and doing home delivery on a subscription basis. And at first, you know, he when he put himself out there, it was like, oh, there's a cute kid selling coffee, whatever. And but then people would actually buy the coffee and be like, wow, this is actually very good. Um, so in the early days, it was just basically teaching them how to roast, how to create branding, how to interact with people. Uh, and that was very simple. When he became a little older, like 12 and 13, he joined the Roasters Guild and started participating in education. Uh, and then as he got older, he's 19 now, uh, it was how to get into wholesale accounts. He deals with wineries and restaurants and uh, stores here in, in Northern California, uh, he received a, a, a letter from our senator, you know, for his efforts. So he, you know, he's become kind of mini celebrity. And then I was remarried here uh, over a year ago and my stepchildren started a very similar a competing business. So I have two brands competing in our garage and uh, their the, their advice is more, you know, how do we attract customers Uh, How do we make the blends? I teach them tasting and blending and and things like that. So it's more sensorial where with my son, it was more of a business. That's where his head was. Yeah. So he had to be the youngest member of the Roasters Guild. Yeah. Yeah, he was actually because he needed special permission to even go on to the like the roasting areas and the roasting tent for, you know, safety reasons. So he had to sign waivers and everything and they had never done that before. So yeah, I believe he, he is the youngest serving Roasters Guild member. Yeah. that That's very cool. And then of course, you know, becoming a, a, a celebrity, I mean, he's following in his dad's footsteps. I mean, <laughs> that's cool. well, yeah, I mean, that could be for better or for worse. I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, he, he, he's, spent a lot of time observing how I interact with people, how I've given presentations. He's seen me speak a million times. And I think he's mimicked some of that. But, you know, he has his own style. And, you know, now he's launched into like the sports performance market with high caffeine blends and using coffee as a a tool for performance. And that's, you know, he shifted his brand into that. 
it's an area that very few people in coffee are, are going after right now. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. Absolutely love that. Well, and we should we should talk about sort of from a fitness perspective. But before we get there, um, do you have a life motto? Uh, well, I mean, my life motto that I've always had is kill the closest snake. And that's dealing with problems that are in front of you rather than far away. So that that's an old um adage I've, I learned very young and I've, I've, you know, that's something I kind of use as a mantra when I am overwhelmed by uh, challenges I have is just kill the closest snake next to you and move forward. So yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's fantastic. And, and really, I think everybody could learn from that because some people end up with like being a deer in headlights when there's too many things going on in front right. of them. So yeah. 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 So, okay. So I, I got to go back to the fitness thing for a minute because I saw that you yeah. are an avid runner, cyclist, um, as well as a watch collector, but we'll, I want to talk about that too. But you know, have either of these habits, like being an athlete, being a collector, has that translated into helping you in your coffee journey? Uh, I mean, the fitness side with coffee, I mean, it's, coffee is one of the healthiest beverages on the planet. So it's it's something that I think goes hand in hand. Uh, early on when I had uh, my own brand, I had a, a blend called Organic Panic, and it was a high caffeine espresso that I served. I was racing uh, mountain bikes back then. And we used to host mountain bike racing at our farm. And um, so we would give away shots of that to athletes. And Bike Magazine gave it one of the best training supplements of, I think it was like 1996 or something. And uh, so I, I've always felt that those things go hand in hand. And I use coffee pretty heavily uh, with my my um, athletic performances, you know, whether it's lifting weights or running. Uh, watch collecting is more like, you know, it's appreciating uh, craft. I mean, which coffee is about that. But it's also gear nerd stuff. Like if you're into espresso equipment or grinders and all that, it's it falls into the same realm of nerding out on something that's made by somebody. And there's been a lot of great technology and coffee that people geek out on all the time. So... Um, but I've never really thought about watches and coffee as, as um, I, I, they weren't related as to why I pursued those two things. Yeah. So. Although, but you know, when you look at watches and, and the intricate nature of it, right, like the appreciation for high quality and, and uniqueness, I don't know. Well, I think, I mean, I, I can say this. So one of the things that I had, you know, I got into coffee in the late eighties when nobody was drinking coffee and nobody young was drinking coffee and what we had done the whole specialty movement what we did was revitalize a dead trade it was a trade that nobody cared about and then all of a sudden there's this new life being breathed into it and it took off to what you see today everything you see from you know starbucks had 11 stores when i started they were nothing i mean these companies were just barely there mm -hmm. And when I was young, I learned about, I tell the story about sustainability. I'm not, it's a very long story, but I learned it from a, a great uncle who was a, a master barber and watch repairman. And I used to watch him work. And my entire, I learned how to shave with a straight razor. And I, my entire life of shaving, I have one razor, one mug, and one brush. It's lasted me my whole life which is reusability and sustainability. And then watching him repair watches, which is a, a piece of machinery that is meant to last lifetimes, plural. I mean, you could pass it down. And it's, it's the idea of not living in a throwaway culture. Mm -hmm. And coffee, you know, those are trades that are virtually dead. I mean, now barbering has come back. It's like a hipster thing, mm -hmm. uh, just like coffee. And you have, you know, competitions in barbering like you do with baristas. And watch watches are now really hot, and there's a lot of YouTube channels about that. But but you know, go back to 1995, and nobody in their 30s were you know cared about watches. It just was unheard of. Yeah, yeah, wow. So, but that is really cool, and I I love the that you not only tout sustainability within the coffee industry, you live that life. You live it, eat it, breathe it, and and in your day-to-day -day practices do that too. So so very cool. Um, and I got to see that full watch collection. <laughs> that, is, that is awesome. Um, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll try to run through these last few questions. I know we're running out of time. But sure. a few few quick ones. We'll do them, you know, with with one word answers or 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 quick um, points. Do you have a coffee industry stat 
Um, you shared some earlier, like around sustainability. Uh, is there a coffee industry stat that you either continually pay attention to or a stat that has an impact on you personally or professionally in choices that you've made? Uh, I, I don't know, but a statistic that really I've tracked in coffee, well, obviously the market is always something I track, but uh, it's really the growth of the kind of the experimental movement in specialty coffee, how quickly that's growing, because that shows you that innovation is still alive, that our industry isn't staling or plateauing. And so that's something I track when you see like the movement of yeast and enzymes was one thing. This huge obsession with espresso culture was another thing. And cold brew, you know, techniques and nitro brew, all of that equals innovation is still happening in our industry. And like you said, it, it points to you're not in a dead industry. It's not saturated. It's not over. There's plenty of opportunity to continue to grow within it. I love that. Okay, so along those same lines, can you share a random fascinating fact that you know about coffee? Like that that at the end consumer would be like, oh, I never knew that. Uh, for men, it's the, the one uh, product that most men get all of their antioxidants from. Really? Oh, there you go. I love that. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so I have what is called the U3 top three. So very brief answers, um, just okay. three of them. Your favorite brewing method? Chemex. Ah. Um, your coffee drink of choice, meaning, you know, hot, cold, black. Hot, hot black, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how many cups of coffee do you drink per day? Oh, 15, easily. <laughs> that is awesome. I am right there with you. Are you, you a Gen Xer? I think we're like the same. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're in the, we're, let's call it in the top, like, Two percent, two or three percent right. of the Xers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, so um, I want to give you an opportunity to share where someone can learn more about you, Mark, or about Mercon. Um, any any of your social media accounts, websites, whatever you want to share. Yeah, so I, I do, you know, tongue in cheek on my Instagram. It's NorCal Globetrotter. I. I actually have for decades uh, jokingly uh, believed that you should travel in a suit and tie at all times. And and people send me photos of how they dress for travel and I rate them. And usually they want to be uh, degraded. So I give them a negative point system. So that happens on that that uh, handle a lot. I give travel tips uh, on uh, you know how to travel in style. Um, MirconSpecialty.com for uh, information about Mircon coffees. Uh, and, uh, I think that's it. Other than that, you can, you know, reach out to me on Instagram. I do a lot of, you know, mentoring of coffee people. I, I have hourly conversations with folks that have lasted, you know, 10 years plus with some of these people. I'm always happy to work with people interested in coffee. So always feel free to reach out. That is perfect. Thank you so much. And I'll be one of those reaching out. Okay, Mark, because there's do, something yeah. I want to talk to you about. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for joining us and for helping us unite the world through coffee. And thanks to you, our followers, for joining us at U3 Coffee. We'll see you next time.